and you'll hear a word. There it is. All right. Well, uh, with that, welcome everybody uh, to tonight's workshop. I'd like to take a second, as I do, um, to formally welcome everyone here. I'd like to welcome you uh, if you're really excited to be here tonight. I know I am. Um, and also welcome if maybe you're here because you signed up and you're just like, well, I might as well just be here, but you might be distracted. That's okay. Welcome to you as well. Um, welcome if this is your first time at a Changing Hands workshop and welcome if you have done this before. Welcome if you are Indigenous American, African American, Asian Pacific American, if you're from a Latinx background or if you're European American, if you're some combination of the above or if you're none of the above, welcome to all. Welcome to our female participants and the males. Welcome if you're trans and welcome if your gender expression is beyond the gender binary. Welcome if you come from a farming background and welcome if you're just getting started. Welcome to the lesbians here, the gay men, bisexuals and queers, and welcome to those whose sexuality don't easily label. Welcome also to the heterosexuals. Welcome if you know exactly why you're here tonight and welcome if you don't. Welcome to those with hidden disabilities and welcome to those whose disabilities are apparent. And finally, welcome to all the parts of ourselves that we bring with us everywhere we go and sometimes we want them to be seen and sometimes we don't. Um, in any case, all those parts of you are real and uh, they're here in some way and I welcome all of it. Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, as always, if there are uh, you know, aspects of our diversity in this room that I've left out, please feel free to let me know. And um, finally, since we're all tied to the land, talking about the farming, farming and, and land, I'd like to welcome the ancestors who lived in this land before us, uh, to acknowledge the indigenous people whose homeland we are now stewarding. I am in Sisters, Oregon, on land originally owned by the Confederated Tribes of Tenino, Warm Springs, Siletz Indians, and Grand Ronde. Um, and yeah, uh, before we get into the, 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 the actual presentation, presentation part of our presentation, I said presentation three times there, um, yeah, just want to give a shout out to all these other great workshops that we've that we've had over the past three months, um, and invite you uh, if you're here to reach out to me if you would like to um, if you would like to visit the recordings to to these great workshops. Um, we have uh, put a lot of work into this, but more importantly, um, we've had just a, a stellar, stellar cast of presenters um, who have shared a lot of knowledge. Um, a lot of great questions and conversations have been asked and, and shared in these in these spaces. Um, and we want people to continue learning from them um, down the line. So uh, these topics, all the ones crossed out, are topics that we have already talked about. And if uh, something seems interesting to you, um, please, please reach out to me. Um, a couple other housekeeping items here. Uh, you will be getting um, an email uh, that's called that has some kind of yeah that has a, a few sort of um, housekeeping -y type uh, extracurricular ways to to engage. Um, one of them is called the Changing Hands Networking Exchange. It is a shared spreadsheet, um, and it's an opportunity for you to put some of your personal info um, in to maybe solidify some of the uh, connections that you make here in these workshops, um, especially if you uh, have land to lease or purchase, or maybe you're looking for land um, in a specific area or looking for a farm partner. Um, we've had a lot of people uh, kind of share who they are and, and where they're at in their farming in their farming stories and what they're looking for. Um, and so yeah, keep your eyes out for that resource. You'll get that in your inbox. Um, and then also, um, yeah, just after the workshop, I mean, I know they're, you know, we're kind of a more intimate crowd tonight, but um, I always hang out after the workshops um, in case people want to stay and chat. Um, just want you to know that that is, that is open and welcome. You're welcome to that as well. Um, let's see here. Uh, lastly, just want to take a second to acknowledge our sponsors, especially our Calendula and Ladybug level sponsors. We have organically grown company whose vision it is to expand the availability of and demand for organic produce, as well as on point community credit union serving Oregon and Southwest Washington with mortgage loans, saving accounts and auto loans. 
Um, thank you to all of our sponsors. They have made it possible for us to offer these workshops to everybody. Um, and that is really important to us. Um, let's see, is there anything that I've left out, Jonathan? Nope, as usual, you did all right. All right, great. Um, with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and um, pass it off to Gabrielle. We have, uh, before we get into the main part of our presentation tonight, which is um, hearing from Scott from the Farm Service Agency, um, we are gonna quickly hear from Gabrielle from American Farmland Trust about a new program um, that uh, is, yeah, that is, uh, some of you might've heard this last week, but it's a, it's a new program that we are excited to, to be a part of and to, to help remote. So I'll hand it off to you, Gabrielle. Um, well, nice to meet folks. And uh, yeah, for the folks who are here, my name is Gabrielle Resch McNally. I direct our Women for the Land Initiative as part of American Farmland Trust. American Farmland Trust is a national nonprofit uh, that we have roots here in Oregon and, and of course beyond. Uh, we've been in the ag game, um, if you could call it that, for the last 40 years. Uh, really getting our start focused on farmland preservation and thinking about how we create space to preserve farmland. Um, as we've continued to grow and evolve as an organization, we think a lot more about stewardship, um, everything from soil health to climate resilience. And then finally, we are concerned about the people who steward that land, both in terms of um, making sure that, that that folks are able to stay on the land and be successful, whether that's accessing farmland, whether that's accessing uh, USDA resources, whether that is connecting them to resources and workshops we conduct. Uh, and then my program in particular is really focused on women and increasingly folks who perhaps identify as non-binary, but are really creating a, a, a gender focused space um, that is uh, meant to kind of connect with people who haven't been as well served in mainstream agricultural spaces and places. We know women and we know veterans as well, veteran women don't necessarily access the resources that are available to them at the same rate as their male counterparts. So we um, create spaces for folks to come together, to learn from each other, to learn from technical service providers, to um, mentor sometimes, to um, share and connect resources. Uh, so we have a project that's launching with USDA National Institute of Food and Agriculture, uh, and it's a three-year project, and it's Women Veterans for the Land. And so we're focused on developing programming that will center the experience of women and non-binary folks in agriculture. It's going to be in Washington and Oregon. Uh, there's going to be some work that happens virtually, and we hope there's going to be some uh, opportunities for us to gather in person. Uh, we do these day long, usually, or you know, six hour long workshops called learning circles. Uh, and there's a lot of connecting and sharing that happens. Usually when we're in person, there is a field tour, a demonstration, time spent on someone's farm, time spent sharing a meal together, uh, getting to know each other. And oftentimes these things build on each other. Um, because we have the virtual world, we do try to also connect some of those, connect online sometimes as well. So we have this work rolling out. We're really interested in spreading the word. So whether you're here tonight or you're listening to this recording later, um, we aim to have really directed programming in years two and three. Uh, but this year we're doing a needs assessment and have the opportunity to do a lot of uh, interviews and facilitated conversations with folks who are either women veterans or folks who serve veterans in some ways in the agricultural space. And so if there's anybody on this call or listening who wants to chat with me more, um, who feels they have a perspective on kind of how we can develop programming to better serve women veterans, um, I would welcome that opportunity. Uh, because we're really we're really committed to creating a program that um, is relevant and hopefully needed. Um, we we got we got the sense it was needed through the partners who put helped us put this project together, but uh, we continue to sort of ground truth with the conversations we're we're having. Rogue Farm Corps is a partner of ours, um, as well as Washington Department of Veterans Affairs, uh, Farmer Veteran Coalition, both the Washington chapter 
and the national um, one, uh, the project called Annie's Project that some folks might know is also a partner. And then we've been doing more work with Oregon State University and their small farms team. And um, so really excited about the team that we've assembled and continue to do that, continue, continue to assemble. So some of you who were here last week saw the presentation my colleague Addie gave. So I didn't wanna do that for you all today, but I do wanna just briefly share my screen so that you can see my contact information uh, and jot that down if you wanna be in touch with me. Um, and of course, you can always reach out to Jeffrey and Jonathan if um, you wanna reach out to us um, that way as well. But I would just welcome, you know, if anyone's here tonight, I, I can, I'm happy to take a question or two um, with regard to our project. Um, I also like fried potatoes. I just want to state for the record. But um, yeah, I don't know if anyone wants to take themselves off mute or put their screen on and ask a question, feel free. Uh, I don't want to kind of belabor the point to the folks who've been with us before, but I'm really excited about this project. I think there's a lot of potential and uh, we're getting lots of interest just from partners and, and folks who we're sharing the word with. Um, and there's been some inkling of excitement around um, maybe an Oregon chapter of the Farmer Veteran Coalition. I've been hearing rumors about that. So I'll be curious to see how this effort and other efforts that Rogue Farm Corps is doing with, with regards to reaching more veterans, um, maybe, maybe there's a chance to do more of that as well. So with that, I'll stop talking and just give space for a minute for anybody with questions and feel free to use the chat as well. I'm gonna try to stay on for the whole workshop tonight. I have a question that I am curious about. Um, yeah, so it sounds like the first year is kind of a research-based year. Um, and then years two and three, I'm just curious uh, if, if I were, you know, talking to a woman veteran or if I were a woman veteran, like what would my incentives be for joining the program? Yeah. Um, well, first I'll say, you know, we encourage folks to participate as much as they want to, and, and that can be one or more events. We are committed to hosting a series of these learning circles, both in Oregon and Washington. We haven't centered our geography yet, and that's where we'll probably have some in-person things uh, that'll, you know, limit our geography, and then we'll do some virtual possible for folks, you know, all around the state to join. Uh, but, you know, what we have found through our work is, you know, beyond this particular project is an incredible resonance um, with women connecting with other women, um, not just the resource providers who come and share um, wonderful resources like Scott will do today with FSA, but um, with getting to know other folks, both in their kind of physical community, but also folks in their kind of community of practice. Um, and, and for women to find other women who have shared experiences and other women veterans, um, there's often a lot of value that comes to that. Um, we've found through our work kind of an evaluation, women really often get in touch with their power, their um, confidence is boosted, and their awareness and connection to resources. There are so many resources available to women to farmers of color who share these overlaps and veterans that most folks aren't aware of. And so we make it our task to connect you to resources, whether it's you know learning better how to manage soil health on your farm, or we do a lot of workshops with, with uh, USDA partners um, and just navigating some of the resources that are available to you, farm loans, farm grants, farm relief programs, uh, how to get started in that space. So I think there's incredible value from the content but I would also argue based on our extensive amount of evaluation work and reflection that part of the value is that connecting with one another and kind of breaking the isolation that a lot of folks feel. And, and, um, and hopefully, you know, today I had a conversation with someone in one of my interviews who said that for a lot of women, veterans in particular that he's worked with, there's a lack of trust in institutions. And I, I'm not a woman veteran myself, so I can't speak on behalf of that, um, that perspective, but um, I can empathize with that, with other um, producers we've worked with. Um, and as a woman identified person, I recognize how a lot of resources haven't served me well. And so I think at, uh, at American Farmland Trust and our program, we're committed to 
by meeting women where they are and connecting them to resources. And I hope rebuilding trust, building confidence, but also sometimes being that kind of uh, bridge builder between kind of the institution and the farmer in those places where trust has been lost, or at least there's just not, not the relationship you would hope. So we're, we're, uh, I think there's a lot of those values, but I um, will be excited to see where, where people get. So that's not a bite-sized elevator speech for you, Jeffrey. I'm sorry, but I'll, I'll make sure I craft one of those uh, when you're chatting with women, women, women veterans. But um, again, anybody who's on the line who wants to talk more, I'm, I'm excited to do that. No, that makes a lot of sense. I think there is huge value in that kind of connection piece. All right, hello. How's everyone today? Hello. Hey. So um, I am trying, uh, just learning about your organization. Um, today I'm hearing a lot about, uh, you know, uh, the women aspect of it. Is that just part of the program or is that the emphasis? Hmm. Well, I should say, and I can let Je Jeffrey describe more of what Rogue Farm Corps is doing, which is broader kind of inclusive of men and women identifying folks. Our program is more specifically focused on women veterans, although I will say as part of our conversations, we have been chatting about um, whether or not we want to sort of open up the conversation for folks who are partnered with veterans who might not be veterans themselves, but in a farming partnership. So, um, you know, a spouse or whatnot who is connected to the veteran community in that way. And we've been exploring that as, as an option. So I'll just say, oh, we definitely are thinking of the farm family, but I, you know, however that looks, but a lot of our programming is more focused on women. But I wanna pass it to Jeffrey because there's a lot of other good stuff happening that's a, a little bit bigger than just our sort of women focus. Okay, great. But before we go to Jeffrey, one yeah. more thing. Um, so I am in Portland. Okay. And uh, we are, uh, we have an incubator project that we will be looking for uh, veterans. So uh, male or female or BIPOC. Okay. So um, if I forward you that information, would that, uh, would you be a resource to help me fulfill the positions that we have available? Oh, we, I would most definitely try for sure. Yeah, if you send that and I'd love to chat with you more about what you're doing. So yeah, if you, I'll put my email back in the chat as well. If you want to send me an email, um, that would be great. Okay, great. Okay, go ahead, Jeffrey. No, no, I appreciate that. That's great. That's what, I mean, that's what this, these workshops are about is like creating these connections and uh, yeah. Um, the, the, yeah, so the, I mean, the program that Gabrielle has been talking about is specifically for women veterans. Uh, but like what we're going to be talking about for the rest of tonight in general um, is applicable to uh, to everybody. And um, I would also maybe consider watching the recording of last week. We, we had folks from or really one person from the Farmer Veteran Coalition uh, talking about, um, you know, basically a, a running through all of the the services that uh, and, and kind of programs that they have. Maybe you're already familiar with them, but one of the biggest uh, strengths that they have is just a massive membership network. Um, and um, that uh, is also potentially a place, a place to look. Um, you know, you could find someone who is uh, looking for, uh, yeah, looking for space to be in an incubator um, through them. So I would get in touch with them. They seem to be very responsive and um, you can pretty much immediately talk to a human being, which is nice, who can like tell you where to go. Uh, we don't have a chapter here in Oregon yet. Um, there is one in Washington, as Gabriel was saying, but uh, there is also, um, I was talking with them last year and then talking with them again this year. And they, it's, it's something that they're really trying to, to get going. I think they just need a little bit more of like a critical mass of interest um, and maybe like someone to kind of take charge of it. And then, you know, and then we have like this wonderful uh, kind of, uh, yeah, connection touch point um, through, through them. And they have, they're just like flush with resources. Um, so yeah, I would check them out. Um, and in general, uh, I'm sure you're talking to some of the other um, incubator farms in, in the Portland area. 
Um, but if if you if you're if you're not and you would like to, um, please reach out to me, and I'd be happy to put you in touch um, with some of the the folks that I know who are um, looking to do the same sort of thing. Um, yeah, I'll put my I'll put my email in the chat as well. Um, with that, I'm just keeping an eye on the time here. Um, I think we want to hand it off to Scott and we definitely have time. We can like come back to this um, at, at the end of the presentation, but want to make sure that we, um, we touch on all of uh, these FSA funding opportunities. Um, so I am going to introduce Scott here. Uh, Scott grew up in Monroe, Oregon, graduating from West Point in 1994 and servicing and serving in the US Army for five years attaining the rank of captain. Following his service, Scott received an MBA from Carnegie Mellon University in 2001 and moved into a career as a commercial banker. In 2009, he started with the Farm Service Agency um, and as a trainee, worked his way up to become a farm loan manager. Uh, Scott currently owns and lives uh, on a 54 acre grass seed farm near Lebanon, Oregon and leases out to a real farmer, it says. <laughs> um, and also just want to point out that Scott, we were just chatting before this workshop. Scott right now is um, in charge of, uh, of, is the loan officer for everything um, basically on the I-5 corridor to the coast from California to Washington. So it's a lot of geography where, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong there, there are a lot of farms in that area. Um, that uh, will pass uh, through Scott's desk if you are, um, yeah, if you're applying for an FSA loan. Um, so uh, Scott is gonna, I'll hand it off to you, give us some, uh, some, of, some of his thoughts and tips and ideas um, on, on how to be successful in that process and also just, yeah, walk us through what the different loan products are. Um, so thanks Scott for being here. All right, thank you much. Uh, do I have to do anything special here to uh, put my screen on or are we good? I think you just do as we practiced, yeah. <laughs> okay, outstanding. Um, <laughs> thank, thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Scott Neiman. I'm a farm loan manager. Uh, like you said, I've been with the Farm Service Agency, which is part of the USDA umbrella uh, since 2009. Um, I'm normally headquartered out of the Salem office. Um, however, I'm going to be moving to the Tangent office probably here in the next month or two. Um, but currently responsible, like, uh, like you said, for the 18 counties on the western side of Oregon. So quite a bit. I have, uh, I'm the only one with loan approval authority so far in the whole area. And I have uh, three trainees that I'm trying to train up to uh, help me out. So extremely busy, um, but I'm more than happy to take any calls from anyone. Uh, just throw it out there right up front. If you want to reach me, my direct line at work is 971-273-4809. And I'm happy to take any calls and uh, talk you through our programs. Um, and also, as mentioned, I know the focus here is on veterans. Um, I'm going to touch a little bit about that. Um, as, as stated, I, I also am a veteran and I um, am kind of a farmer and that I own a farm, but uh, I have interesting perspectives on, on ways that we can help uh, veterans and um, get you into farming or increase your farming. Um, with that, I'm gonna start talking about and bring up a PowerPoint presentation on probably our most popular um, program, which is our farm ownership loans. We, we, we can't see your, uh, your presentation yet. Yeah, I'll, I'll bring that up here in just a second. <laughs> okay, cool, cool, cool. Just making sure. <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to uh, pull up a PowerPoint here in just a couple minutes um, and talk about our most popular loan program, which is farm ownership loans. And these are loans uh, in order to purchase farm ground, improve farm ground. Um, you know, that's the gist of it, to acquire farm ground for your own so that you can farm. Um, and now I will pull up that PowerPoint presentation. Okay, trying to figure out how to move the thing on part on the top. 
so that I can access uh, where I get it to the full screen. Let's see. Try going to... There we go. I can move that bar down. Oh, nice. Good job. Okay. Sorry, my uh, PowerPoint and uh, these Zoom call experiences are a little out of my norm at the moment. Okay. It looks All great. Right. <laughs> Thanks for your patience. <laughs> Finally got that set up. All right, so here are some of the basics for our farm ownership loans. Um, we can directly lend up to 600,000 for real estate purchases, real estate improvements, and even buildings or a modest farm dwelling. Um, the actual regs speak to the modest part of the farm dwelling. Um, this is a, an increase from what we've been able to do in the past. Uh, probably about three years ago, we were uh, bumped up from 300,000 uh, to the $600,000 level, which in Oregon finally makes a little bit more sense. You know, the 300,000 level, you know, we weren't doing a whole lot of loans because there wasn't a whole lot of land available in that kind of ballpark. Um, 600,000, we've, uh, our demand has really gone through the roof and I get calls virtually every day on somebody wanting to purchase farm real estate. Um, the good news for this is that the Congress also did bump up our budget. Uh, we have nationwide, well over a billion dollars for this program. I don't remember the exact number, but we uh, haven't even come close to using it all up in the last few years. So there's plenty of money. In the past, uh, I couldn't say that. We ran out of money actually rather quickly. And we would sometimes have up to a year wait before when your loan was approved and when we could actually fund you. So, you know, that's a huge improvement. We have money. We are doing these kind of loans all the time. Um, and this is definitely within our wheelhouse. Uh, these loans can be used to pur purchase bare ground. And this is a common question that people ask, you know, can you, does it have to have a home on it? Does it have to be bare ground? We can do virtually anything that is approved for farming. So bare ground, home and land, orchards. Um, I've even financed, and you guys probably even know this place, but I'm not going to call them out by name, um, a city lot in Portland, uh, a female farmer that farms up there. I helped her purchase a city lot in Portland that she farms on. It's a beautiful little piece of ground and I thought I was lost when I was in Portland looking for it, you know, because it's right in a little rural, uh, little um, suburban neighborhood of, you know, 1940s houses and stuff. And then all of a sudden, bam, you got a farm. Mm -hmm. So we can do anything as long as it is legally allowed to be farmed on. Um, we can go up to 40 years if needed. So it, that's all based on cash flow. Uh, we start at a smaller number typically, um, but if cash flow dictates, then we can go up to 40 years on our term. Our current regular loan rate is 2.875%, so it's a rather low interest rate. It changes every month. We get a new rate sheet that comes out every month, but the loan gets locked in for the duration of, you know, the rate, sorry, gets locked in for the duration of your loan. Um, and another kind of interesting aspect of our farm ownership loans is that FSA typically pays for the appraisals. Um, if you're not familiar with farm appraisals, these can easily run up to $5,000. I've seen them higher than that. So that's uh, quite a benefit that we offer as well. What is covered in the farm appraisal typically? Yeah, it's, it's a quite a thick document that they look at soil types, they look at uh, comparables, um, they look at and value all of the improvements on the ground, uh, in including any irrigation systems and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, they take into account soil types. It's, they're pretty comprehensive. And the thing is, they have to be a certified general appraisal. So it's not your typical you know, drive-by average mortgage type appraisal. Um, there's only you know, slightly more than a handful of actual certified general appraisers in the state of Oregon. Um, and so you know, there's a limited number of them and they put out quite a comprehensive appraisal. So yeah, good question. It's, it's hard to believe that an appraisal can cost you know, anywhere from 2,500 to 
I've seen them up as high as 7,500, you know, for more complex parcels and such, but that's how it works, unfortunately. So uh, <clears throat> do these work with the uh, VA benefits? Um, no, no, good question. But um, yeah, we don't work in coordination with the VA or you know, the VA home loans, you know, which are completely different from what I understand. Um, yeah, completely different programs. And I, I have not seen in my 12 years any overlap between the programs. Got it. Let's see if I can figure out how to go down on this thing. Should have practiced my PowerPoint skills a little bit better here. It's all right. Any uh, thoughts on how I can advance this? I thought the arrows would work, but it's not so much. Try clicking the mouse somewhere on the screen, anywhere on the screen. Okay. How's that? That, that seemed to work. Okay. All right, so this is actually probably the most important part of the discussion on uh, farm ownership loans because I get, like I said, several calls a week, usually at least one call a day, of people that are interested in purchasing farm ground with FSA assistance. And typically the call will go like this. I read on your website, that you have loans to help beginning farmers acquire farm ground. Well, that's true, but the, there's a disconnect between what's being advertised um, by our agency and what people are reading. So, and I think the main disconnect is the definition of what a beginning farmer is. So a beginning farmer for our purposes is somebody that's farmed for 10 years or less. And m most people, you know, when they read that, they think, absolute beginning farmer, they've never actually farmed before. And so that's where the disconnect comes. And, uh, you know, sometimes I feel like I'm a crusher of dreams because unfortunately I have to be the one that implements these rules and these rules are passed down to us from Congress and, you know, they're hard coded and we have to follow them. So this is a great chance for me to put this out there so that people can understand what the real eligibility requirements are and then I can give you some resources where you can, you know, read a little bit more about that. Um, so eligibility, one of the main ones, you can't obtain credit elsewhere. So the reason that that eligibility criteria is there is because our rates, our terms, uh, the way we look at your credit history, everything is much more favorable than the banks for the most part. So if we were to compete against the banks, we would kill them each and every time and I would have more business that I could possibly handle, uh, even with a team of 100 lenders. So it'd be, you know, they don't, the Congress had this eligibility criteria in there so that we don't compete against the banks. So if you can get a loan elsewhere, we ask that you do. And if we take a look at your financials and determine that we think you can get a loan elsewhere, we'll ask you to look first and get rejected before we're able to help you. So I want to put that one first because uh, it really is the most important. I'll get calls from people who are just kind of rate shopping and that's not a, a thing that we can compete and we don't you know, play that in that arena. Um, I get calls from folks that have a million dollars in their checking account. Well, you know, you could probably get a loan somewhere else. You know, <laughs> that kind of thing. Or you're just making money hand over fist doing whatever it is you do. Well, that's wonderful and I applaud you for it, but that's not what we're here for. We're here to help farmers that can't get financing elsewhere. Second one, good credit history. So we're not allowed to acknowledge or consider your actual credit score, but we do look at your underlying credit, showing that you have a history of repaying your loans when they come due. Uh, we can work with a little more troubled credit we can work with um, bankruptcies as long as they're past three years. We can work with bankruptcies where it's out of the person's control, like medical, um, maybe divorce, you know, some of those things. So we have a little bit more flexibility. 
but generally we work with folks with good credit history. Uh, US citizen or legal resident, I think that kind of speaks for itself. Um, owner operator of a family sized farm after the loan closes. So we are only supposed to work with family sized farms. We're not working with, you know, big, huge corporate farms, you know, um, big mega farms. Uh, we're working with folks that are really tied to the ground and they're doing a significant amount of the labor themselves. So that's kind of one of the criteria there as well. Farming experience. Now this is where I weed out, unfortunately, probably 95% of the people that call um, asking about, you know, whether we can help them purchase a farm. So you need to have operated or managed a farm for three out of the last 10 years. Um, you know, so that gets most people because they don't have that farming experience. They read that we can help them. They read that we help beginning farmers. Well, there, we have other loans and I've talked about some of those loans in the past uh, presentations, I think on our micro loan, for example, one of our loans that we can um, do where you don't have a lot of farming experience. But when we're talking about lending, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, potentially, uh, the government has felt that it is a um, predictor of success that you have farmed for at least three out of the 10 years, last 10 years. So you have that recent farming experience. Um, we can't work with folks that are hobby farms or nonprofits, nonprofit farming operations. Uh, you have to be a farm for profit. Um, the hobby farms, they don't want us, you know, working with folks who just basically have rural residences. They want it to be real farmers who are trying to turn a profit by selling food or fiber. Um, sales of at least $1,000 to be considered a per commercial farm. That's kind of the bare minimum threshold where we will consider you a farm. Um, so you're actually, you know, making sales and producing something that people want to buy. Looks like we have a question. Great, I yeah. love questions. <laughs> All right, yeah, I didn't just want to jump in there. Um, it was about the three years or showing the three years. Um, more than just managing, as it says at the last thing you said, sales of at least a thousand. Is that the one thing that um, that has to ha has happened for every one of the three years? Um, Yes, yes. Um, you know what they're what they're trying to keep from happening and uh, just picking a random uh, example is a person who comes to us for assistance to let's say buy a ranch, you know, a $500,000 ranch, and they've had a couple cows on their place, and maybe, you know, sold one cow for 500 bucks. You know, they want us to work with real farmers, not just the casual or the rural residence type thing, um, but real people that are really trying to make a go of producing a product and selling it. Okay, so um, so I've been in so I've been in a farm program, right? Um, started off first year as training. Second year, I actually moved on to a plot of land. Um, third year, which I'm not counting these three years, but the third year, I. Uh, started selling at farmer's market, right? So this year will be my second year of selling at a farmer's market. So uh, does that still, that equates to I'm entering into my second year as far as uh, the program here? Yes, yes. The, um, the way it's defined in our regulations is that you've gone through the entire cycle of farming. So Correct. from planting to harvesting to selling basically. Yes. Okay. Um, um, and now, then, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. So a uh, CSA, would that, uh, if I sold a CSA, then that would count as a, a year if I made over the thousand? Or, yes. Okay. Yes. And there's some, a couple of other eligibility issues that will kind of come into play and I'll, I'll bring them up, I think, on the next slide. Okay. Um, but yeah, it sounds like you are building that history of, you know, sales and such, which we would absolutely take into consideration. And there's actually also some additional ways that you can get, um, and this is also a next slide, you're giving me a great segue. Um, 
that uh, you can get credit for one of those three years. And so that actually might come into play potentially in, in your own example. Um, but yeah, if you don't mind, I think I'm gonna go to the next slide and I think I might answer some of these questions a little more in depth for you. Yes, sir. Okay, let's see. Ah, so I go back. There we go. So, as I mentioned, there are some different ways you can get credit for one of those three years. And this is kind of where the, um, the veteran part comes into play. Uh, all of our eligibility requirements are the same for everyone. However, um, there are a couple little perks for being a veteran, um, one of which is the third bullet on here where you can get credit for one of those three years of farming experience. If you have a leadership or management experience while serving in any branch of the military, that's the exact regulation. I think they kind of leave that little um, uh, gray area for us to make that determination whether you had leadership or management experience. Um, but that is one way that the veteran experience comes into play. Uh, the other ones, uh, if you have an ag related degree of any kind, uh, significant management, business management experience. It used to say owning a business, but I think they tempered it down a little bit to just business management. Uh, every year they seem to be making it a little more easy for folks to get these loans. Um, and then you can see some of the other ones. And uh, I think Rogue Farm Corps is actually mentioned in our regulations as a potential farm mentorship or apprentice program as well. And it's actually, you know, in hard coded in our regulations, Rogue Farm Corps programs. So just thought I'd mention that. <laughs> so if you did an apprenticeship, and I don't know what you have to offer in that kind of area, and maybe you can answer that better, Jeffrey. But um, you know, that is a way that you can get a year of experience. Um, getting a youth loan with us and repaying that counts as a year of experience. Um, and then working with an established, uh, having having an established relationship with a retired farmer or rancher through the SCORE program, uh, Service Corps of Retired Executives, I believe that stands for. I think that's run through the Small Business Administration. Um, but anyway, there's a, a number of different ways that you can get credit for one of those years. What they're trying to exclude is folks that you know just have farm labor um, as their experience. They want somebody who actually has to make management decisions, um, whose decisions affect the profitability of the farm. Uh, you know, not just um, running a tractor because at the, you know if you're doing that, you know, I, it's absolutely a valuable part of a farm, but does it give you enough exposure to decision making that can actually affect the farm? Because you're really only in a one small, you know, narrow focus at that point. Can I clarify something with that slide? Yeah. Uh, it's just a question that I've, that people have asked me. Uh, those, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but those, those different ways to get a year knocked off, they don't stack. The maximum you can get, you might take, check all of those boxes, but you're only going to get one year off the three years. Correct. There, I didn't, there is um, one stacking way it's so obscure that I don't recall it off the top of my head and I've never seen anybody that's been able to meet that. But I do need to technically say that yes, there's a possible way to get two. Okay. Um, but you'd have to really, really dig in our regs and you'd have to have some really interesting background uh, for that to come into play. But it okay. is technically possible. So I don't want to sit here and lie completely. <laughs> okay. Uh, so one quick question. Um, <laughs> So let's see. So if I was, let's see, I, I have a year accumulated. I'm entering in my second year. Does my second year start once I um, hit the thousand thousand dollars for that for this year? Uh, well, that's a tough call. Um, there's a lot of calls that are subjective that'll be basically me deciding if you meet that. <laughs> um, Got it. You know, they want to see you go through the whole farming cycle. So I suppose if you were able to grow something rapidly, harvest it rapidly and sell it rapidly, that potentially you could meet that uh, year experience a little more rapidly. Okay. So, but 
a lot of these things are going to be judgment calls and uh that's why they pay me the big bucks i suppose all right all right <laughs> i wish it was big bucks but <laughs> that's why they keep me on the payroll there we go uh, so uh, i have another this, question that comes up and you might be answering this in a second and if you are just you can tell me that and and that, that'll be good um but the 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 proof of a thousand dollar sales per farming cycle or per year um so i often get asked if if you have to if it's just proof of sales or if it's proof of profit um in your schedule f's like because you might be spending five thousand dollars and you know making a making a thousand dollars in sales and revenue but that's not profit um, right Right. So, and of course, that would affect, you know, theoretically your ability or the confidence that the FSA would have in your ability to repay that loan. So how do you how do you answer that? So it is gross sales. Gross. Um, but, you know, at, at the end of the day, we're, when we're looking at a farm ownership loan request, we are going to use your history. It's going to come into play. We're going to take a, into account, you know, if you're purchasing ground, what that ground will help you produce. Um, so, you know, you have to have a plan for what you're going to do with that ground and what you're going to grow or what you're going to, you know, animals or whatever. We're going to take into account the revenue that that can all generate. Mm -hmm. We're going to take a look at the expenses, either historical or using enterprise budgets, like Oregon State University has a lot of great enterprise budgets. We'll take that kind of stuff into account. We'll take into account all your off-farm income, all your off-farm debts. Um, we'll take into account that you need some money to live on, just generally. Um, and then at the end of the day, if going forward that number looks positive, then we can move forward with the purchase. Um, so to your point, if somebody's generating $1,000 of sales, but they got $50,000 of expenses, that's going to be factored in. While they might be farming, it's not going to make the loan work. <laughs> you know, the yeah. loan still has to have traditional underwriting standards where it cash flows and there's sufficient collateral. Yeah. So that's kind of how we take that all into account. We'll take a, a close hard look at your history. And you know, history is the best predictor of the future. So that's going to be a very important aspect. Um, the easiest you know the preferred way to show all that is of course your schedule apps on your tax returns um, you're reporting to the government that you're farming mm -hmm. um, and we you know that's it's wonderful when we can get three years of, of schedule apps we have all your history you know we can uh, see your your trends your production and those are the easy loans you know when you can see all this in the history and this piece of ground is just going to make it easier for you to farm you know, so those are the nice ones. They don't always go that smoothly, but that's the gold standard of proving, you know, your, your history of farming. Um, but, you know, there are other ways to do it as well. Now, I think this is, um, this slide kind of speaks a little bit more to uh, what the gentleman was asking just a minute ago, um, the proportionality test. So, the government doesn't want us, as I mentioned before, helping somebody buy a ranch or a person who's sold a couple of cows a year, you know, a $500,000 ranch for somebody who's done even $1,000 in sales, right? Um, it's just not proportionate. And that's where this kind of test comes into play. So at a bare minimum, um, we need to see your farm generating gross sales equal to what an annual loan payment would be on the farm. So to put that in, in kind of more real numbers, uh, a $500,000 loan, you're gonna be looking at an annual payment in the ballpark of $30,000 a year on that. So at a, at a bare minimum, we would need to see that you are at least generating 30,000 in gross sales a year uh, in order to meet that proportionality test. You know, so it's not an overwhelming you know, amount of sales to show that, you know, you need this property, but it does keep everyone a little bit more honest so that we're not, you know, lending to folks that, that really, you know, aren't doing a whole lot of farming. Um, another thing I want to touch on is, you know, what kind of commodities do we look at? 
Um, we, I get calls. In fact, I got a call today from somebody who wanted to talk about timber farming. Well, our regulations don't consider harvesting timber to be farming. Um, we can work with trees, but they have to be Christmas trees, um, orchards, or in some cases, um, softwoods that are quickly growing and have a you know, regu regular harvest schedule. We can work with those, um, but we can't work with your traditional timber type um, pieces of ground. And we don't do exotic animals or crops. Um, you know, I've had some interesting phone calls. I've had a gentleman that wanted uh, help with his uh, farming of mice for the um, bird market you know, for the raptor market and such. Wow. I've had uh, folks call about worms. Um, you name it, I've received calls about it. If there's not a pretty well-established market or you can't show that you already have a market, um, then it's really not something that we can work with. Um, so, you know, in the Willamette Valley, this is actually probably one of the most diverse farming areas um, certainly in the United States and maybe even the world. You know, in, in the area surrounding the, my Salem office, there's about 200 commodities that are grown, you know, regularly. And that's uh, far and away more than most areas of the country. So, you know, we're able to work with a lot of different things, but, you know, if I have to question it, then we probably can't do it. Joint financing. So while we're limited you know, directly to loans up to 600,000, um, we don't always do just loans up to 600,000. Uh, we're able to work with commercial banks. Um, we can also work with uh, landowners, potentially if they're willing to get in on the financing um, and do loans you know, significantly higher than 600,000. We don't have a cutoff per se, but we don't want to be a small player in a huge loan. So we're probably, you know, our our wheelhouse is loans up to maybe a million two, maybe a million five, somewhere in that area. Um, outside of that, you know, you're really too big for us. You know, we're not going to be a. We don't want to be a small player in a big loan. And you know, if you need that much financing, you may not be a family-sized farm anyway. Uh, we can work with most other commercial banks. We can work with landowners for joint financing. We do have some benefits that we offer to encourage the banks to do the joint financing. Uh, one is we have a pretty nice, uh, little bit lower rate for joint financing. So if we do 50% or less of the loan, we can offer a 2.5% rate on our piece. And we're also willing to take a second lien position and let the other bank have the first lien position on the ground. I don't know if everyone knows what I'm talking about when I say these things, but um, this is a huge encouragement to a bank because worst case scenario, you're not able to pay your loan. You know, the land has to be foreclosed upon, it's sold. The person who's in the first lien position gets paid out first, you know, from the proceeds of the sale of the land. Um, if there's nothing left after the first guy's paid off, the second person takes a bath. They lose money. And so the government is encouraging the banks to do these joint financing deals, and they allow us to take a second lien position to do so. So I've, I've worked with a lot of different banks. I've explained our programs. There's uh, you know, a few of them in the area, and offline, I'd be more than happy to talk about you know, some that are more active than others in these programs. Um, but I've been able to convince a lot of these banks that this is basically a no brainer as far as it goes you know, for lending. And so we do get a lot of uh, interest in these joint financing opportunities. So I just wanted to throw that out there because you know, Oregon prices are a little crazy and even 600,000 these days isn't buying you a whole bunch of farms. The beginning farmer down payment program. Uh, another way that we can help uh, beginning farmers get onto a piece of property. Again, this is for folks that have farmed for 10 years or less, you know, which is our definition of beginning farmer. Um, you know, again, also not everybody's definition of a beginning farmer. For this program, it's, it's 
it's a great program um, if you have some cash that you're willing to put down. So if you're able to come up with 5% of the purchase price in cash, um, then this is something that we might be able to offer you. Uh, our piece can be as low as 1.5% over a 20 year term. And we require the other lender to have an amortization of 30 years and they can't have a balloon payment before 20 years. So they're giving you a, a nice long amortization to keep your payments pretty low and not requiring you to try to refinance it until at least 20 years have gone by, which hopefully at that point, you'd have some equity built into the land. Um, for this loan, you can see the criteria on the little uh, table there below. Um, the gist of it though, is that for this program, we're only able to lend up to $300,150. So, you know, it can, it can help, but um, these days we're not doing these nearly as much as we used to in the past. Question about that. Question about that. When the, um, yeah. Oh, I'm getting an echo. Okay, it's gone, great. Um, are the, uh, the eligibility requirements the same as for the, the farm ownership loan? Or is the eligibility truly just that you have the cash to, um, the cash to, to meet that final No, score. you had it right the first time. Yep, all the eligibility requirements are the same. The only thing is that you're a beginning farmer. So you have the potential, you know, the ability to potentially access this program if you also have that 5%, you know, down payment. Okay. You know, getting the, a better rate, 1.5%. Yeah, the, is, that's, that's absolutely the draw of this one is you get that really, really low rate yeah. Um, but unfortunately, they didn't bump this one up, you know, to the six hundred thousand dollar level. Right. Uh, it basically got maintained at the previous level, you know, slightly higher yeah. by one hundred and fifty dollars. So not, you know, a whole lot of difference. Um, so, yeah, we're not seeing this come into play very much because, you know, the the wheel well for this type of loan would probably be in the you know, six hundred thousand, seven hundred thousand dollar range you know, when we're working in joint financing. And so, you know, there's just not as many properties that this pertains to. And so, yeah, I don't see a lot of these late fees. We're doing a lot of joint financing because it looks like these days, the, the vast majority of our loans are in that um, $900,000 to like a million two area when we're doing joint financing deals. Mm. Okay, how to apply. Um, I'll pull up the uh, farmers.gov website here. Uh, I think I can hopefully figure that out with this technology. Um, how to kind of show you, you know, where to find some of this stuff. Um, I, you know, I briefly talked through it here. There's a section on farmers.gov. Uh, I think it's in the upper left hand that talks about loans. And then once you click on that, there's an area down below that talks about farm ownership loans. Uh, which is what we call these things. And then below that, inside that area, you'll find some fact sheets that kind of cover, you know, everything that I'm talking about this evening. Um, and then all the application forms as well. Um, I'm not sure if I'll have time to really get into the, you know, the application a lot. You know, we, I might be able to bring that up a little bit and go over it briefly. Um, but the main application for a farm ownership loan and you could also just Google this and it'll come up easy enough. Uh, it's form FSA 2001 uh, loan application. Um, in addition to you know, that application, as well as the other forms that you'll find on the website, uh, typically we're gonna ask for three years of your tax returns, uh, both personal and business if you have an entity. Uh, we're gonna look at your off-farm income and need verification of that. Uh, typically, that's your last two pay stubs, but you know, W-2s and other things can use uh, to serve to prove that off-farm income. Um, something that uh, I put in bold because I really want people to have this as a takeaway, uh, FSA cannot pre-approve you. And so there's a few reasons for that. You know, it's not like a, a mortgage where your entire uh, loan is predicated basically on your, your income, you know, your off-farm income, your job. Um, 
with these kind of loans, we're also looking at what your farm can generate, you know, the income that it's going to provide uh, and the expenses associated with that income. So in order to actually, you know, be able to look at it in a big, broader view, we need to know, you know, how many acres you, you're working with, um, what you plan to grow, what we think you're going to produce, you know, as far as yields and such, what we think your price will be on those yields, and, and arrive at your income for your farm that way, and then look at all the, you know, typical farming expenses that you would expect to see for that, um, and factor that all into the equation as well. So we're not just looking at your off-farm income, we're looking at the farm and what it'll generate. And so we have to know the exact piece of property that you wish to purchase. And that kind of speaks towards the next bullet. And unfortunately we can't pre-approve. So, you know, we get a lot of um, frustrated real estate agents that call me because they want that pre-approval letter before they'll you know, even show you a farm or something. Um, Unfortunately, in those scenarios, we're probably not a real good fit for your financing purposes. You know, if a piece of property is so hot that there's tons of people that want it and, you know, offers are getting flown everywhere and such, it's really not going to fit well with our programs. Our programs work best when, you know, maybe you're already leasing this property and now you're getting, you know, being given the opportunity to buy it. Uh, you're buying it from family. It's a property that's been on the market for a long time. Um, there's an owner that's very patient, <laughs> you know, cause none of this stuff happens super fast, unfortunately. And, you know, when real estate agents get involved, they want things to move quickly. They want a pre-approval letter. And unfortunately it just doesn't work very well with our programs. Um, and the last bullet point there, um, we will not even begin the underwriting process on a farm ownership loan request unless you have a purchase, a signed purchase agreement where the seller has agreed to sell you that piece for a certain price and all the other terms are spelled out you know, as far as that purchase goes. So that is one of the things that we'll always need right up front um, you know, when you apply. When you apply, if you don't provide that, we'll send you a letter and request that as well as any other information that we're missing. Um, I don't know that I have a slide on it, but I can briefly explain a little bit how the process works. You know, so person sends in an application, we're able to get that via mail. You can drop it off at our off, any of our offices. Um, you can scan and email that to us. And we also have a secure file sharing system that we can invite you to use as well to get your application. And once we get your application, we have 10 calendar days to review that and let you know what you're missing. And at that point, we send you out um, what we call a 15 day letter, which gives you 15 days to provide the information that we've requested in order to have a complete application. If at the end of that 15 days, you haven't provided us what we've asked for, uh, we send you out a second 15 day letter. Again, requesting that same information that you haven't provided or um, anything new that we can think of, but typically the same information that, you know, you're missing from that first letter. And then at that point, if you don't provide it, then we automatically withdraw your application. Uh, you can reapply at any time, but that's kind of generally how this process works. Uh, there was a question, Scott, about how, um, uh, oh, that echo again. Okay, great. There's a question about how, uh, about if these loans, um, if the FSA can approve loans for land with an ag or conservation easement on it. With conservation easements? Yeah. So an ag, a, a piece of land that has a working lands conservation easement taken out on it already. Um, can, is there any reason that the FSA can't work with, with that piece of property? I don't believe so. Um... So that's a piece of typically not really usable ground. Is that what you're talking about? That's in a, like a wildlife conservation type easement? They could have a working lands conservation easement on it. So that would be specifically for agricultural use, like protecting it. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, pr protecting it to keep it in agriculture. In to keep it in farming. Okay. Yeah, yeah got you. Um, we, can, we can do those. The only issue arises on how much that easement or that, con yeah, that conservation easement affects the value. Um, because it will, you know, if you can only use it for farming, 
um, that's going to reduce the overall value in most cases of a piece of ground, mm -hmm. you know, which the previous owners probably receive some compensation for typically. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really the only thing that I can see hindering that is that, you know, it may not appraise for what, you know, everybody wants it to sell for. Yeah. So that, that absolutely gets taken to, in, into account. Um, you know, same with like, um, uh, what are they called? When you allow somebody to live on your property until they pass away. I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but um, those kind of things always affect the value of the land. Um, and they're taken into account during the appraisal process. And, you know, we need the land to appraise uh, for what it's selling for. And so that can come into play. But we certainly don't mind if land is just, just used for farming forever. Yeah, yeah. that's <laughs> absolutely not a problem. It just, uh, you know, it usually reduces the value because it can never be developed. It can never, you know, potentially have any other uses. So, mm -hmm. you know, the appraisal people take that into account. Mm -hmm. Let's see here. Okay, so it looks like I've reached the end of the PowerPoint slides. I'm going to try to bring up um, best I can, the farmers.gov website and see if I can navigate through that. Awesome. Probably hit escape on the um, PowerPoint. Click on it and then it should get out of the show. There you go. Okay, there we go. All right, I don't know if it allows me to navigate through this during the Zoom or not. Uh, again, my Zoom skills are uh, rather depleted. <laughs> Use it early, early on during the pandemic, and then uh, the government came out with our own little uh, system that I'm a lot more familiar with. Um, but anyway, this is the farmers.gov website, and you can find a lot of great information here uh, on our programs as well as uh, many, many other programs. Um, the key point is, for me, at least, is this loans area. It looks like it is going to allow me to navigate through this, which is exciting um this is all i do I, uh, loans i don't do any grants so i don't do any programs i can't speak intelligently about anything else uh, this is really my only area of expertise is farm loans okay and if you scroll down you'll see this loan options area um and then the specific one that I was talking about this presentation um, is this farm ownership loans. Now uh, you can see some of our other loans below this, the micro loans, uh, which to reiterate are probably our second most popular loan because they're actually available to people that don't necessarily have any farming experience. You know, they just need to have a, a good plan and a mentor, somebody that knows what they're doing as far as the crop that they want to do. Um, and, and list that on their application. So just another sh real quick shout out to the microloans. They're up to $50,000, um, typically used for annual operating expenses or equipment purchases. Uh, a great product to help people that are just starting off. Um, and we have, we've worked with, and this gentleman um, was talking about incubator farm. We've done a lot of work with the uh, Headwaters farm. Uh, we've worked with several people out there and. Uh, the East Multnomah County, I believe. East Multnomah Soil and Water Conservation District. Yep. Yeah. yeah, we work with several farmers out there and uh, a lot of them have taken advantage of these microloans to uh, you know, purchase pieces of equipment like delivery vans and uh, like BCS tractors. You know, a lot of those things that the small scale farmers really, really need. Um, anyway, talking about the farm ownership loans, click on that. And that'll get you to what I have been discussing for the last uh, over half hour or so. 
And you can see some of the fact sheets here that talk about you know, these farm ownership loans. And then more importantly, at least uh, in my eyes, the application forms that you'll need. And as I mentioned, this FSA 2001 is the main loan application form, um, but there are other forms that we request uh, to include, you know, if we don't have your tax returns, we can use this three-year financial history form. Uh, we're gonna need your production history. Uh, typically it's your yields. Um, if you're doing a small, you know, a row crop or a CSA type operation, we're not gonna really get into your yield stuff that much because you're really talking about, you know, rows versus acres. Um, and in that case, we'll, we'll primarily use your sales history and any uh, trends that we see your sales going as opposed to your yields. Uh, you know, it just doesn't work well. Yields don't work well for small row crop operations or nurseries or that kind of thing. Um, see some of our more generic forms, uh, but the more important ones, the balance sheet, um, I think I discussed in the past a little bit about what a balance sheet is. I'm not gonna cover that in any depth, um, but we need to know where you are on your assets and liabilities. And then we're going to need, and this is kind of your business plan, um, your projection. This is what you're going to be projecting for that next your upcoming farming year. Uh, and this is where we'll see your projections for income and expenses, off-farm income, um, everything. And then that'll help us, you know, underwrite your loan. For the, then, um, oh, yeah. For the, for the balance sheet, um, is that a, your, are you asking for the balance sheet for you as a person and all of your assets and liabilities as a person um, or for the farm business that you've been so, running for the last three years? Good question. Um, both. So okay. if, you're, if you're farming as an entity, your application is going to be as an entity. We have to make our loans to whoever is doing the farming. Yeah. Um, so if you're reporting the farm income as an entity, um, that is how you'll have your application. And we will need a balance sheet for both the entity and for the individual members of the entity. Okay. So if it's like Jeffrey's Farm, LLC, and I'm the only, I'm the sole owner operator, uh, an owner operator of this operation, then you'll want a balance sheet of Jeffrey's Pharma LLC and then also me, Jeffrey Van. Correct. Yep. Yep. Right. <laughs> we need to see who owns what so that we can potentially, um, you know, we might have to have, if you individually own the equipment, we might have to have you pledge the equipment as collateral for Jeffrey's Farm, who's getting okay. the loan. So we have to kind of know how everything's divvied up. Okay. And then in terms of the, in terms of the business plan, um, I, I assume, I mean, you have projected an actual income and expense there. You're looking for the projected and actual to see how we've done, how, how accurate Jeffrey's Farm LLC has been in the past um, or like how well we've been able to forecast ourselves and we use that as a predictor of the future. Um, mm. And then also you need a written business plan uh, of like what, we yeah the way that you would imagine like a traditional business plan to look no we we, we actually don't um it's a, a certainly a delightful treat when i do get a business plan that is all written out and you know explains everything you're doing and all that kind of stuff it's it's a wonderful treat but it's something i very rarely see and we don't require okay. so what we what we need to see is you know your history and so we typically ask for your three years of tax returns yeah. Um, if your most recent year, like 2021, for example, a lot of people haven't done their tax returns yet, uh, we will still need to see your actual income and expenses for 2021. Okay. And then what we're trying to get with this form, this 2038, and, and you can do your, your 2021 income expense that, um, on that form, which is why they have the actual income and expense there listed. You can use that form if you'd like. Uh, to provide us your 2021 income and expenses if you haven't done your tax returns yet. Um, but the form is best used uh, for your projection. It gives, you know, area for you to put in all your, um, you know, projected yields, your acres, your projected prices, and, and add up, you know, adds up all your uh, revenue. And then it gives all of the, 
you know, pr primarily Schedule F type expense categories um, for you to show all of your expenses that you anticipate going into this coming year. So people that are filling out these applications right now are filling them out projecting for 2022. Sure. In, in most cases, um, if they're cases where it's like a hazelnut orchard or something, we also have to see projections for when they reach what we call a typical year. You know, so when, you know, that those trees or like blueberries, you know, when they're in full production, that kind of stuff. So we can kind of figure out if the, if the plan makes sense when you get into full production as well. Okay. So that, uh, yeah, great questions, by the way. Appreciate it. I don't like to just, uh, you know, <laughs> drone on and on and on. Um, it does look like I'm out of time. Uh, if you want, I can get into the actual application. Um, otherwise, I'd you know, just open it up for questions at this point. Yeah, thanks so much, Scott. I mean, that's, yeah, a lot of great information shared here. And I have more questions. Uh, I have questions that people ask me that I would love to pass on to you in this case, but definitely want to open it up to um, everyone here. If other people have questions, um, please feel free, Scott. As you can tell, uh, it's uh, a master of the FSA loans. Um, yeah. Okay, while people are thinking of their question, I'll ask one of mine. Oh, no, looks like we have one. Oh, no, I was just going to say, yeah, he, uh, very good job, Scott. Uh, definitely give me a pattern as to what I need to uh, be preparing um, to move towards the uh, loan. So I appreciate it. So are we going to be seeing an application from you in the future? Is that what I'm hearing? Uh, yeah, the plan <laughs> is uh, towards the end of the, end of the year or uh, into next year. Oh, good deal. Yeah, gotta cool. find that land first. Yeah, yeah, that's a hard part, especially in the greater Portland area. It's yeah. either uh, A, very expensive or not available at all. Yeah, yeah that's true. I'm, I'm, I think I'm crossing the river just a little bit. Gotcha, yeah. well, good deal. Yeah, you know, I, we've done some stuff in uh, urban areas. So if you're able to find something, you know, we can absolutely consider even city lots. Okay. So, yeah, I don't know how available those are, but <laughs> <laughs> but we've done it before. So, all right, we'll keep all things in mind. All right, outstanding. Uh, so, question here: the the farm ownership loan and the farm operating loan can they be stacked? Can can one apply for both? I mean, if if imagining that they're like they're underwriting all checked out. Uh, does the FSA allow that, just having having both liabilities at a time? Yes. Yep. Short answer, yes. We can absolutely consider. Uh, we can also, heck, you could actually do potentially three loans at a time. Uh, you know, an annual operating loan, uh, farm ownership loan, and maybe even equipment loan at the same time. Um, you know, I, I don't want to see somebody try to get an instant farm. We do want to see, you know, something there. Um, of course, you know, if you meet the eligibility for a farm ownership loan, then you've already been farming. Um, but, you know, we, we can do up to, you know, several different loans that, you know, are for various parts, as long as we don't go over our, our dollar allocations. Okay. okay. That makes sense. Um, and with the, I know this is not what we were talking about tonight, but with that, with that farm operating loan, um, so there's something in there about being able to use that to like pay for living expenses while the farm is getting up and running, right? We can potentially lend for living expenses as well. Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah. And, and how is that determined? I mean, is that like, is that your call or? Um... Uh, <laughs> probably a little bit of that. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to define that, you know, so, course, yeah. you know, we're going to look at your monthly, when it comes to an annual operating loan, we're going to look at your monthly income and expenses. Okay. And the reason somebody needs an annual operating loan is because they typically don't have that income coming in for the first several months, you know, and in, in kind of a very traditional farming operation, you know, you're, you're 
don't have any money really for the majority of the year until you sell after harvest. And so mm -hmm. the point of the annual operating loan is to kind of get you to that point. And so we're going to look at your income and expenses to include your living expenses. And then that deficit you know, in all those months leading up to before you actually get paid for your crops is what your annual operating loan is based on. So it's going to incorporate your living expenses as well as all your farming expenses, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we're looking at every month um, and, and that's something that we ask for when we do any annual operating line is a monthly cash flow projection okay. to show you know, when you expect that income to come in, when you expect the expenses to come out and to help um, in those monthly deficit areas to get you to a point where you've sold your crops or you've sold your animals and you finally have some money and you pay us all back. Okay. That makes sense. I've got a, I've got a million questions here. So if y'all have <laughs> questions, please go for it. Well, if you don't think of them right now, you all have my number, at least uh, at the start of this recording. So, and you can also find me, I'm sure, somehow navigating that farmers.gov website or an FSA website, or if you Google my name, it'll probably pop up with FSA. There's a number of different ways to track me down. Um, also, my email address is scott.neeman, N-I-E-M-A-N, at usda.gov. GOV. Um, so yet another way to get hold of me. Um, I'm extraordinarily busy, unfortunately, because we're dramatically understaffed, but I will try to get back to you as soon as I possibly can. Um, yeah, with that, I mean, everybody, it's, yeah, Scott is a great resource. Um, please, I, I, even, even though you are so busy, please, if you're listening to this recording, reach out to Scott with your questions. Um, Hopefully you've watched the recording first and maybe some of your questions have been answered. So we don't need to flood your inbox or your voicemail box uh, with questions that could have been answered. Um, and it looks like there's another question in the chat. Um, before we get to that, just gonna see um, Jonathan, if we can launch that poll um, to just get some feedback on tonight's workshop. Um, also want to, there it is, thank you. Um, also, uh, yeah, want to point out that uh, you're going to get a, an email after this with an opportunity to yeah, sign on to our Changing Hands Networking Exchange. Also, um, with a link uh, to provide more feedback because you'll see that this poll that you have in front of you, um, of course, doesn't give you any space to actually write things down. So, um, yeah, just keep your eyes open to that. And thank you all for being here. Um, with that, let's get, to, let's get to this other question here. Is the down payment program only for beginning farmers or are other underserved populations eligible? Um, I believe that is really only, I mean, it's not, you know, that it's not exclusive, you know, of course, but um, it, it's meant just for beginning farmers. So, um, you know, you couldn't have been farming for over 10 years and be in a underserved, you know, demographic and still be eligible for it. Um, so I, I think that answers that question. Um, you, you can certainly be a socially disadvantaged applicant as well as a beginning farmer and qualify for it. But uh, that really, the main predication for that loan is that beginning farmer status, you know, having farmed for 10 years or less. Um, and since you mentioned it with that, uh, the socially disadvantaged part of things, is it is it true? I mean, this was something that uh, came up last year that the FSA has like a separate pool of funds that is reserved for um, for these socially disadvantaged farmers. Yes, and and that's a call that I um, you know a question that I get quite often. You know, people call me up and say, you know, I'm a, a female farmer or I'm a black farmer or what have you, a different you know demographic, um, and um, you know, I'm socially disadvantaged per your definitions. You know, I'd like to get a loan. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't quite work that way. You know, they still have to meet all the same, everybody has to meet all the same eligibility requirements. There's no special eligibility requirements, except for, I think what I pointed out, the potential way to get maybe a, a credit for a year for veterans, for example. Um, 
the only real main difference is that pool of money. Um, and again, also unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your point of view, there's plenty of money right now. And so it doesn't really come into play. We're not running out of money. About three or four years ago, that conversation would have been far different because we were running out of money rapidly, uh, right. but there remained money in those pools for the socially disadvantaged applicants much, much longer than just for your generic, if you will, farmer. So um, yeah, it's just different pools and, and it's not super helpful at the moment, um, but who knows? Who knows how it'll play out going forward? Yeah, no, that's super helpful. Um, and just to clarify, just tying it back to, to veteran farmers here again, would veterans qualify as one of these? If, if the pool, you know, if the program were really popular and running out of funds um, and that, that, uh, that pool of money did come into play, would, would veterans qualify? Yeah, I believe they've been put into that uh, social, the, that SDA type category in that pool of money. So I do believe that they would have uh, longer access to funds than, than most folks. All right, awesome. Um, well, it's 7.30. Uh, with that, everybody, you heard it here. FSA has money, so <laughs> go out <laughs> and make sure to read all the eligibility requirements. Make sure to read all the applications. Make sure that uh, you, you, yeah, you have uh, proof that you've been denied from another loan or that you were unable to get a loan elsewhere and you meet all the other, the other eligibility requirements and um, get in touch with Scott if, if still the FSA is the right way to help you um, get started, uh, yeah, with your, with your farm purchase and you meet all those requirements. Um, and patience, please patience. <laughs> we're overwhelmed at the moment. Uh, so we're trying to get caught up on everybody, and get caught up on our loan requests, but uh, I need to get all my folks trained and get some more folks hired. Awesome. Well, hopefully, yeah, hopefully that goes smoothly for you, Scott. And thank you so much uh, for once again, uh, just, yeah, walking us through step-by-step step what all of this looks like. Um, I know for a lot of people that we work with, it is, um, it's overwhelming and it's overwhelming to the point that people are deterred um, from even attempting it, even though, you know, they might be the right people that this, that these products are designed for. So um, really helpful and a pleasure always to hear from you and to all our participants, whether you're here live or watching the recording. Um, thank you for, yeah, for checking these resources out. Um, and yeah, with that, I think we can end the recording. And